Wait. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> At least the sun's come back out, so it's a bit nicer now. <laughs> I think the last weekend was quite damp and rainy, so uh, no idea. Cool. So we are right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first HackConf online talk. My name is Tony. I am part of the organizing team of the HackConf conference, and I'm happy to be your host today. As you know, we postponed uh, this year's HackConf to 2021, however, we really missed interacting with you, so we decided to bring the HackConf experience online. Our kind hosts today are the Creative Space Launchy, who provided us access to the platform Hopin. Thanks to them, you will be able to enjoy our online events. Our guest for this uh, online meetup is uh, Yuan Finlay. Yun is part of the organizing uh, of the operations and reliability team and the Financial Times, managing incidents across the globe. Uh, you've probably met him uh, at our past editions of the conference as well. Today he is going to talk about tips and tricks how to work better remotely. If you have any questions during his talk, you will be able to drop them in the chat here and afterward afterward uh, he will answer you so let's start it oh yeah it's all good um so thank thank you very much to tony and teddy and everyone else involved in organizing it's really cool um we've got a pre-recorded video of it in case my internet drops out because uh obviously that can be a thing that happens sometimes but uh the talk itself um is based on something i did last year at hatcom which was around remote working and how we try to help people do that at the Financial Times. Um, and then given the current situation where now we are all fully working remotely for most of us, um, I've reworked a lot of it and updated it to be, to reflect where we are at the moment and things like that. So um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope it is interesting and useful and I'll be more than happy to uh, chat afterwards in the um, in the chat box if you have questions. Um, I think I mentioned it in the talk as well, but I will share the slides and the links to the various uh, other guides and documents and stuff um, in the chat and on Twitter as well. So if you would like to follow some of those and look at the guides that I mentioned, you're more than welcome to do so, but don't worry about having to take a copy of the URLs off the screen or anything like that. But yeah, I think that's pretty much it for me. Um, I guess we're all ready. Do we need to, so we should, should we, we should let Tony know, was it? Um, Can we do that first? Oh, yeah, Am I still live? I don't know anymore. <laughs> Let's check the stage. Okay. Thank you to live me for the introduction and I hope it was good. Uh, I did lie about one thing though, because the title of my talk isn't quite right. It's actually how to move house when you can't leave the house. Back in January, I made the decision that I wasn't going to renew my current flat and instead find a place to rent with two of my friends. It was a lot harder than we expected. We didn't realise that each London borough has its own licensing laws when it comes to people living together. And this meant that we found a lot of properties that were ideal for what we wanted, but the landlord couldn't or wouldn't rent to three friends. We went through around 20 different viewings. Uh, we had one last minute rejection where another party sniped us after we had paid the deposit and gone through the referencing process. And we were all very stressed. But after about a month and a half, we managed to find somewhere that we liked that was within our budget. We paid deposit for the second time. We went through referencing again and we finally had a move-in date. However, we still had two fairly big worries. The first was the news around the global coronavirus situation wasn't getting any better and we were worried that London might be locked down before we were able to move in. The second was that we still didn't have a signed contract even on the day before we were due to move in. Nevertheless, all we could really do was carry on so we rented a van and began the first day of our moving journey. Given that the previous occupant had left their crack pipe in the dashboard, we were clearly off to a good start. And seeing how there were only three of us, we thought that we wouldn't need too many trips. 
Because after all, how much stuff can a single person have? The answer is lots, lots of stuff. After about an hour and a half's worth of swearing, we managed to bundle one person's uh, items into the van, and we were done with the first step of what turned out to be quite a long day. I think I'd done quite a lot of heavy lifting by the time that this photo was taken, which is probably why I look quite tired and grumpy. And it ended up being quite a journey. Our stuff was scattered across various places in London, but after many hours, eventually, we managed to reach the end. We only had one trip left to do, back to our new house, when disaster struck and our tyre let us down, quite literally. We were very lucky that we were outside of my old flat at the time, otherwise we'd have had, we would have had to wait by the side of the road in the rain for the RAC person to turn up. It all worked out in the end though, and finally we dropped the van off, and the contract arrived in our email inboxes, and we finished the first day of our moving journey. I'm a senior engineer at the Financial Times. Currently, I work on the operations team. We're responsible for supporting the FT's production systems and technology across the globe. Although we're most famous for the physical newspaper, our digital subscriptions and content have been at the core of our business for a while now. Last year, we hit 1 million paying subscribers, and revenue from our online subscriptions is one of the primary ways in which we make money. Since the coronavirus outbreak, our key focus has been enabling our editorial teams to drive customer engagement. We've been supporting them to run live blogs 24-7, publish daily charts on current statistics and trends, and to run live Q&A sessions with our readers. To give you a sense of our scale, we have a total of 1,236 live production systems. 248 of those are what we call platinum, and these provide business critical capabilities. These are things such as our journalists being able to publish content, or our customers being able to subscribe and access the FT.com website. We're strong believers in continuous integration and DevOps working practices, and that means that we release to production roughly 180 times per day across the business. And yes, that does include Fridays as well. When I first started at the FT, I didn't think of myself as working with remote teams. Because after all, the team that I joined was based in London, and I saw them every day in the office. These days, our main technology hubs are in London, Manila and Sofia. I came to realise that although my team were in a single location, we still needed to interact and collaborate with people in different countries and time zones on a daily basis. When I started researching this talk, I realised that we had even more bureaus and journalism offices around the world. They're not our main technology hubs, but we still have some people and services there that we need to support. I began to think more about this when I joined the operations team last year. Our mission is to ensure that the services supporting the FT are operational and available to our customers. And because we're a global company, our team is split between London and Manila, which ensures that we can provide 24-7 support for all of our systems and products. I'd previously led a team split across two locations, so I was familiar with some of the communication and culture challenges that can arise. Video calls are good, but they still add an extra layer of friction for communication. They're not quite as efficient as just chatting face to face. And when people were stressed, there was always a risk that we could slide back into a us and them mindset, but we were very careful to try and avoid that. However, now that I'd joined the operations team, there were two additional challenges that I hadn't anticipated. The first is that there's a seven hour time difference between London and Manila. And this is a much wider gap than the two hour difference that I'd had when I'd been helping to set up the FT Sofia office. The second challenge is that we run a 24 seven shift rotor. And that means that we may only have a small number of the team working at any given time. When my old team needed to make a decision, it was relatively simple. We were able to quickly jump on a video call, to have a chat and then come to agreement. But when everyone is on shift across a wider gap in time zones, that's simply not possible. Some people will be on the early shift and others on late. I'll talk a bit more about how we tried to solve this later on. I'm going to record scratch and freeze frame to briefly talk about a different move. Not my house move this time, but the move of the FT's London office. Because the story of how we began to enable remote working 
actually started around four years ago. Our office move took several years of planning, execution and hard work across the whole of the business and we saw this as a perfect opportunity to transform the way that we worked. Toby Bridgham was leading the project from the technology side and he's written a really good series of blog posts on the overall process. I'm going to highlight two key points that are especially relevant to our current remote situation. And the first was that as part of the office move, everybody was given a laptop, which would be their only work device going forwards. This was so that we could move around the office and plug into docking stations at any desk, but it made it much easier for everyone to work remotely, as well as to reduce the time and effort that we spent supporting old desktops. The second was that we added full support for online video conferencing into every single meeting room. Our flexible working policy meant that people would often work from home for one or more days a week, and the end result was that remote meetings became quite normal across the business. For many teams, video calls became the default. We weren't a fully remote company after the office move was completed, and that was never our goal, but it did mean that most teams ended up using a hybrid of co-located and remote work. I really like Martin Fowler's blog post on this topic. He groups team structures into four general categories, going from least to most remote. A single site team has everyone in the same physical location, usually within the same room or bank of desks. This makes it really easy to turn around, speak to your teammates and see what they're doing. A multi-site team consists of two or more groups in different locations. For example, the operations team that I'm part of, which is split between our London and Manila offices. Satellite working is when most of the team is in the same location, but a small number of them work remotely. Some teams already did this on a permanent basis, such as the cloud enablement team, who I'll talk more about later on. Company-wide flexible working, though, meant that almost every team operated in this mode for at least a few days a week. In our case, we often didn't realise when people were working from home, because most of our communication is on Slack. There's Google Meet for live discussions, and then we use GitHub or Google Docs for any asynchronous work. It was quite common that we would be talking and collaborating without any real trouble, and only later realised that nobody in the chat was actually in the office. Or, even when we were in the office, we would often move floors to sit close to the people that we were collaborating with, or to take advantage of the sunny rooftop. So all of this helped to further embed the idea of remote working into our culture. Finally, we have fully distributed teams, which brings us up to the situation that I think most of us are in right now, with everyone working from their own location full time. I don't think we had any fully distributed teams to begin with, but because of the initial work that we had put in, it wasn't a huge step for most teams to make that jump. All of this meant that we were in a relatively good position when it became clear that London, along with the rest of the world, would be heavily affected by the coronavirus pandemic. We immediately began planning what would need to be done if we closed the office and started to run practice working from home days across the business. This uncovered some problems that we began working to solve, but we had confidence that it would be a fairly smooth transition for most teams. ThoughtWorks recently shared their remote work playbook and that talks about some of the higher level strategic steps that are needed to go fully remote. While we hadn't seen this playbook when we first began our planning and testing, we've read it now and it's been really good to realise that we've covered a lot of the same areas. I definitely recommend checking out the full guide because there's a lot of useful tips in there. I'll share my slides after the talk as well, so don't worry for now about trying to save the links. It turned out that in reality we actually had even less time than we thought. A few days later, after we began our planning, it was officially announced that the entire company would switch to remote working from the 16th of March, which was ahead of any of our UK government advice at the time. Our preparations were underway, but there was still a lot more that we needed to do. The first challenge that we had to overcome was, while everyone had work laptops, not everyone is fortunate enough to have a home office, or the tools needed to work comfortably remote for a long period of time. Fixing this required a huge concerted effort from lots of teams in our global enterprise services division, including people like end user computing, our networks team and our cyber security team as well. Because I personally was moving in between two houses, 
I didn't have a proper desk or internet connection, and I was needing to tether off my mobile data. Our global service desk put a huge amount of effort into procuring monitors, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots and peripherals around the world, the staff that had essential roles and people with occupational health issues as well. This was made especially tricky because all tech equipment was suddenly in very high demand by every company, with supplies and shipping extremely disrupted in some locations. This is about half of a single delivery that we were preparing to send out from our London office about a month ago now. We were trying to ensure that everyone at the FT has an appointment with a work physiotherapist as well, and that's to evaluate their workspaces and suggest improvements, so that people don't end up working while sitting on the sofa for a long period of time. The second challenge was our VPN. The majority of our systems now live in the cloud and they don't require staff to be on our corporate network to access them. But there were still some key legacy systems that are in the process of being migrated and these do require VPN access. We're licensed for 500 simultaneous users and we've never needed more than that because our disaster recovery plan has always been to use our global off-site uh, disaster recovery offices, which had their own network connections. But now that everyone was working from home, we were rapidly approaching our limit at peak times. To help mitigate this, one of our teams, the digital newsroom team, brought forward the release of Spark, which is a brand new custom-built content management system used to publish all of the FT's web content. The previous CMS was slow, it required VPN access, and there was a lot of technical debt that caused issues for our editorial teams. <clears throat> Pardon me. While we were cautious about rolling out a new tool, while oh, oh no, cautious about rolling out a new tool while everyone was still adapting to working remote, we realised that the benefits of going live massively outweighed the disadvantages, and the team did an amazing job of supporting the release. Combined with, combined with some other migration work that we've just completed, we're now in a much more comfortable position. I mentioned at the start of my talk that I struggled with a way to include the whole operations team when I wanted to make changes to the way that we worked. I was used to being able to quickly get feedback or agreement from everyone. I didn't want people on my team to feel excluded from decision making, especially now that we are all remote. But equally, I didn't want to have to send an email to everyone and then wait maybe three days for everyone to read it and respond. When I told my boss this, they gave me some advice from Amazon's founder. Jeff Bezos talks about decision making and how decisions can generally be grouped into two types. Type 1 decisions are like walking through a one-way door. That decision has a big impact and it's quite hard to reverse if you later change your mind. Type 2 decisions, on the other hand, are much easier to change. They're like walking back through an open doorway. I realised that most of the changes that I wanted to make to improve the team fell into this category. So rather than try and get approval from everyone on the team ahead of time, I realised it was far better to run ideas past everyone that I could reach, make changes based on their initial feedback, and then just try it out for a week and document what we were doing, so that the whole team were aware. If we felt that things weren't working out, we could go back to the old way with very little effort. The larger Type 1 decisions, which have a bigger impact across the business, are where the technical governance group come in. We founded this one year ago because our technical teams are split across three different countries and we found that it could be difficult to make wide-reaching changes that affected multiple areas of the business. The aim was to ensure that teams had the opportunity to provide feedback and oversight on high-impact changes. In the past, it was only technology leadership that attended these, but now we have it open to a much wider group, not just senior management. Teams submitting proposals are expected to have broad agreement before they come to the group, which then meets remotely every two weeks. This fortnightly review allows everyone to share their feedback, identify gaps that might have been missed, and to be aware of any upcoming strategy changes that might impact their teams. The reason that I'm using my house move as the tenuous, te tenuous theme for this talk is that I'm pretty sure many companies are in a similar state of chaos as when we first moved in. There were some advantages to moving into a house with two of my friends just at the beginning of all of this, and one of which is that there's been a lot to keep us busy. We spent a few days unpacking, finding places for things to live, and then hiding all of the boxes. However, one of the disadvantages of moving into a mostly unfurnished house is that we didn't really have anything to sit on. 
To fix this, some of our friends donated two sofas to us, which we eventually managed to get up to the fourth floor. And that's definitely all of my workouts done for the rest of the year. We had to dismantle one of the sofas completely to get it in the van, which meant that we had to then put it back together again, without any instructions. I quickly got fed up with this and left in a huff to go and have a beer, but my flatmates persevered, and a day later we had a somewhat respectable living situation. I have a much nicer place to work now compared to my old flat. I'm much closer to the coffee and the smoking area, which seems to be mostly what matters for me. And to begin with, when we first moved in, I was able to go for some nice walks at lunchtime along the river, or make some friends in the local park. On the left is Otto, who's a very waggy, friendly and extremely dribbly poodle. On the right is a nameless squirrel who nicked my crisps when I wasn't looking. So if you see them, please get in touch, because I do want my lunch back at some point. We still had a lot more to do at work as well to help teams with the new remote situation. I mentioned the cloud enablement team at the FT earlier. Prior to our current situation, the majority of their team was based in London, with one person permanently based in the Netherlands. They'd already spent quite a bit of time working out the best way for them to collaborate and pair program remotely, which they've shared as a really helpful guide in the link at the bottom of the screen. I definitely recommend having a read because it's got lots of useful tips and advice. For their regular pairing sessions, they found that VS Code's Live Share plugin was really helpful, alongside Teammate to provide a shared terminal between team members. They then use a separate tool called Whereby, which they use for video and audio, as it provides better screen share quality than Google Meet. Slack was already widely used across most of our technology teams, but there were still some areas of the business that hadn't seen any widespread adoption. That quickly changed once everyone was working remotely, and our priority was to help onboard them as smoothly as possible. Slack provides some useful analytics, and I was quite curious about how our stats had changed. The red line here shows the 16th of March, which was when the FT went fully remote. You can see the uptick in active members the week before, when the initial comms had been sent to the company, and we began onboarding new teams into Slack. Our number of daily messages has roughly doubled since mid-March. It's been fairly stable. And I figured you might want to see my first attempt at creating those charts as well, which didn't really work out. I'm not normally allowed to make charts at work due to crimes against data visualisation. Since we had got quite a big influx of new users, maybe 300, 400, we realised that a lot of our tips and guidelines had been passed along by word of mouth. We had already started an internal Slack etiquette guide, but we had to quickly make sure that it was ready to release to everyone. I'll touch on a few points that I personally think are important, because a large Slack workspace can be quite overwhelming for new users. First of all, we want people to be happy joining channels to ask questions, but to be comfortable leaving them again once they have an answer. To help with this, we've disabled the default channel joining and leaving notifications. We encourage people not to set notifications for every single new message, but instead limit it to direct mentions only. We set expectations as well that people may not respond immediately if they're busy, and recommend using statuses and do not disturb mode when they want to focus. Some of this may sound quite basic to us, but for people not familiar with like online messaging or Slack, it's quite surprising how many people ex were, expect were thought they were expected to read every single message that came into Slack. On the topic of statuses, we realise that the default Slack statuses don't really make sense when everyone's working remote. And we've now updated them to things that are more relevant for our organisation, and I definitely recommend that you do the same. And finally, a personal bugbear of mine. We ask people to avoid using channel-wide notifications for messages that don't require everyone's immediate attention. While I was writing this, I realised that I've ended up being the person who gently and politely helps people understand why doing at channel can be quite disruptive. And I think it's important that this is done publicly so that everyone can see the explanation for why we discourage it, but never with the intent of being frustrated or, with, or to shame someone. There's also a nice guide by Equal Experts on how they use Slack, which has a fairly detailed Slack etiquette guide as well. It's definitely worth checking out if you're struggling to set up guidelines for your own internal messaging tools. 
We have a total of 1,664 public channels, many of which are old and out of date. This makes it really difficult to browse for channels that are useful and relevant to everyone's interests. So each team tends to compile their own list of useful work channels, but we've shared some company-wide social channels that anyone might be interested in. On the first day of working remotely, we set up a working from home community channel, and this has been really great at helping people still feel connected while we're all at home. To help with the sheer number of channels that we've got, we're looking at using the Slack Gardener bot by Equal Experts. It's meant to find any inactive channels, ask any members if they still want to keep it, and then archive the channel if not. However, I am slightly terrified of installing a bot that's deliberately designed to go and archive Slack channels, because I don't really want my next talk to be how I accidentally archived the entire FT's Slack organisation. I think I'll definitely be testing out thoroughly on a personal Slack workspace first. Google Meet is our default video conferencing tool, and we found the automated closed captioning to be quite useful. The quality of the captions is generally quite good. We have a couple of deaf engineers at the FT who find this very useful and helpful, and lots of hearing people like to keep it enabled as well, because it makes it easier for them to read something if they didn't quite hear it. My friend Ben Fletcher uses an interpreter, and initially he was struggling to get things working so that we would see his video in meetings, but hear his interpreter's audio. He managed to solve this by using a virtual sound driver to reroute his interpreter's audio from Skype into Meet, and it seems to be working out well so far. One limitation of video calls though is that it's very hard for one person, more than one person to speak at a time, and often a handful of people can unintentionally dominate a call. I've not tried these, but I like the idea of these uh, video conference cards, which let people quickly flag up some common meeting things without needing to interrupt the speaker. My friend Lee Port works for the Government Digital Service, and he mentioned that their teams use a similar system of hand signals. I first saw these in action at DevOps Days London, where it was very handy to make communication smoother in large group discussions. Teams at GDS have been using these for quite some years now, and they find it really helpful for online meetings to show when someone agrees, disagrees, or wants to speak. We've been trying to help people to stay in touch with, with each other as well, and some teams have set up daily coffee breaks where people can join for a chat in the afternoon if they're free. We also use an app called Donut to organise coffee roulette across the wider business. And every week, everyone in the coffee roulette Slack channel is paired with someone that they haven't met before. When they're free, they arrange a coffee in a virtual chat. It's a nice way to be paired up with people that they might not otherwise meet. We've been using this for a little while and found that it encourages people to help break down silos and to build connections across the business. We organise an annual hackathon as well to help everyone collaborate across different locations. These have previously been based in the office, but last year we tried to make sure that our London and Sofia locations would be connected over video calls. This year, one of our teams in Sofia won one of the categories, and this is Kate Reardon, our Chief Product and Information Officer, presenting their trophy over Hangout. Our hackathons are usually more towards the end of the year, so it may not be a
Hey everyone. I do you hear us well? I hope so. I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk as much as I do. Uh, so now is time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, you can drop your questions in the chat here and Yuan is going to answer them. Yeah. Can we get audience people to share as well? Or is it only me? I quite know how this works. I think so, we are live now. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So I can read out uh, Sebastian's question uh, from a little bit earlier on. Let me scroll up and find that one. Okay, so the, the first question, uh, and th these are really good questions, I like these, um, is how do we manage the fact that all of the bureaucracy makes the operation less, less agile? Um, and I think, I'm guessing what you were referring to there was when I was talking about the technical government, uh, technical governance group. Is that is that right? Um, I think that's probably what that's referring to. So maybe I didn't make this as clear uh, in the talk, and maybe I should update it. But um, in general, what we do with our teams is we fully trust them to make the right decisions for themselves and for their products and their services. So for anything that relates to things that they either own or do or the ways that they work, um, often people will go ahead, they will decide things for their team and they will make those changes. There's no need to get those uh, signed off or approved or double checked by like leadership people or anything like that. Um, even if the changes that we make or the, or the things that we do, even if they don't work, um, when they don't work, we often learn something from that and then we share that knowledge with everyone else. So it's still useful in those cases. Um, but the reason that I brought up the technical governance group is that you're, you're absolutely right. It adds more bureaucracy. And but trying to coordinate things across maybe 400, maybe about 400 engineers or something like that. If we want to make changes to perhaps our technical strategy or to the way that our standard monitoring definitions are or our standard health check sort of like formats or logging things like that those can affect lots of different teams and it's really hard for one team to go how do we get that approved how do we make sure that we've not missed something how do we make sure we get people's feedback and that's that's what we're talking about we're talking about the much wider impact stuff um, across the whole of the business um, not so much the day-to-day -day stuff. Does that help answer your question there? Uh, if I didn't pop a message in, or if I did pop a message in the chat as well. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll move to your second question uh, while I wait, which is how do we manage the fact that as a person, uh, we need social interactions between co-workers, uh, but without the pressure to work? Um, and yes, the virtual layer becomes heavier over time. And as I mentioned at the end of my talk as well, obviously this is quite, uh, I think, trying for everyone at this time with mental health. Um, so I touched on some of the things that we've been trying to do around the social interaction stuff. Um, and those are the more sort of, like, I guess, the, again, maybe the wider things that we do across different teams and areas at the FT. Um, lots of the teams by themselves, uh, they they already have their, they, they either set things up for their own teams like coffee breaks or um, like after work catch ups if people want to do it. Not everyone does and often some people don't want to have more screen time when they're not working, which is understandable as well. Um, but we've, we've done quite a few uh, like after work drinks for some of our friends to catch up and have a beer after work. Um, or non-alcoholic drinks if they don't drink. Um, and we're trying to find that balance where we have those opportunities available, but we really don't want, we want to make sure that people don't feel pressured to join in um, if they don't want to, or if they have other things that they want to do. Um, for me personally, outside of like the work, sort of like socializing, um, I mean, the, we've, We've, I think we, I've been quite lucky that lots of my friends have had a house party or Zoom. Um, so we've been able to do drinks or I can play online board games as well. Um, and I'm, it's, it's not the same as it used to be, but, and it, it's never going to be perfect, but at least for us, I hope that people feel that they have enough uh, 
of that, you know, like non-work sort of like interactions. They they still have that place to uh, chat stuff or share jokes or things like that. Um, does that answer your question there? I hope so. Please feel free to ask any follow-up questions as well. If 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 uh, my answers um, cause someone else to think of a question, please feel free to pop it in there. Um, what else did we have? Uh, so one from Haralan. Uh, uh, would we keep some practices or teams as a pandemic? And I think the answer is yes here. So I mentioned at the end that we're starting to look at how we uh, slowly have people, if they want or need to, return to the office. But I do think um, for lots of companies, not just ourselves, lots of companies will probably look at this and go, well, it kind of changes the dynamic of how we work, I think. And I might, these, these are my personal feelings, by the way, these are not um, what we're planning at the FT or anything like that. But my personal thought is probably that there will be lots more people who, because we have been forced to work remotely, are now able to work remotely, whether that's their managers or their bosses uh, are more accepting or understanding that people can do that or we now have the tools or the equipment to do that. So I'm sure for some people, given the choice between being at the office every day and having a maybe, you know, like possibly an hour and a half or two hour commute or something like that, may well end up working from home part of the week or m most of the week and then going to the office uh, as and when they need to. Um, we don't have any concrete plans around this at the moment. But the plans that we are looking at based on the UK's government advice uh, right now that they've released just this weekend gone, um, even if we start going back to the office, it will still be very, very different. And we will have to uh, like the start times will have to be staggered. We will still need to have social distancing. Um, there will be things like we might have to do one entrance where people go into the office and then one way systems to avoid you know, like a big group of people. So I don't think we will be back to any normal situation anytime soon. And I am fairly confident that lots of people will not fully work remote, but want to keep some of the benefits of what we've got um, at the moment, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, please, uh, let me just scroll down. Ah, question from Alexander. Uh, how can we guarantee that all people in an online meeting are doing their job and not just recordings? <laughs> I quite like that one. I did see um, on Twitter where uh, I think there was a kid at school who had taken a, a video of themselves, sort of like sat there while they were um, uh, watching TV or something. Um, the, sh the short answer is uh, we don't. And we don't really care because one of the things that I'm very proud of at the FT is that because of the way our, our culture works, um, we have a lot of trust in our teams and our people on those teams. Um, and we are very comfortable in letting people work in a way that suits them better. Um, if that means, so for myself, I take a longer lunch break because I can go for a bit of a walk and then take time off there. Um, and people, my boss will trust me that, you know, I will make up the time elsewhere or that we will still get things done. Um, we don't try and do monitoring. I know um, there was some talk as, uh, about uh, Zoom where it had some tracking feature. I don't quite know the details. Um, we don't try and do anything like that. We don't uh, want our staff and our teams to feel that, you know, we're kind of watching. Why aren't you doing as much work? Why aren't you doing stuff there? Um, for other companies, I have no idea. And I imagine that for some companies, this is a bit weird because if you have a manager or a boss, or if there is a manager or a boss that is quite um, micromanaging, then maybe they are struggling to understand whether people are actually working or not, which I think is a terrible attitude personally to take uh, about your team. Because if you don't trust your team, then honestly, we probably shouldn't have hired them and you shouldn't be micromanaging them. You should be trusting that they know what the right things to be doing are. Um, we've also made sure that we are encouraging people to take time off and take breaks and um, to not be 
uh, at their laptop like 24 seven. Um, and we've made it really, really clear to everyone at the company, we're not expecting everyone to be at their normal output. This is not a normal working from home situation. And it's definitely not a normal work situation. So we expect everyone's output to dip. I have days where I know I won't probably get much done because I'm not feeling great or I will just pick up a few bits and pieces here and still make sure that everything's okay. But for us personally, our priorities are make sure that our people are healthy and well and that they are coping well with, uh, like, I can't remember who it was earlier, but the mental health impact um, of all of this. And then the second priority is to keep the business running. And then after that, we will look at keeping features coming out and delivering value and stuff like that. But we are in very, very strange times at the moment and nobody should expect teams or people to be operating at a hundred percent like normal output, if that makes sense. Does that help answer that one? So, uh, oh, we've got some more questions. So, uh, another question from Sebastian. So, so how often do the FT audit their operations? So that's uh, around the, whether what we're doing meets the goals that are proposed at the beginning. So that's a that's a good question. And this is so I I didn't talk about this in the talk, but um, so when it comes to uh, I guess like group direction or strategic um, alignment. So we're talking sort of like making sure that what teams are doing is in line with where we want to take the um, business and whether we're delivering value. So we use. Uh, we switched maybe about a year and a half ago to objectives and key results um, or OKRs. Um, and I think this was something that was started at Google um, some years ago. Um, at first, it was, I'll talk a bit more about what it is, but at first it was quite hard. We struggled with it. It didn't really make sense. Um, and as we did more of it, it started to feel a bit better. The idea here is I'll try maybe try and find a link to share about this as well if anyone's interested. But the idea here is that um, we have our technology department wide objectives for this quarter. Um, so that might be reducing our, or increasing our savings by X amount or um, uh, in our case, it might be around engagement and uh, subscriptions uh, to increase those by whatever that is. What that does is that's our top level objectives. And then below that, we will have teams and people come up with the key results of how we get towards those. And then for most, if not all of our work, maybe not all of it, maybe not all of our work actually, but for most of our work that delivers business value, um, it should somehow ally, or we should be able to see a way in which it helps contribute to some of those objectives. Um, and we do this on a quarterly basis and score ourselves and how well we did. Um, this isn't scored so that we can rate teams or people, and it's not something that feeds into, uh, say, performance reviews or anything like that. But it's a way for us to look at if we had an objective that we didn't meet um, at all, um, then maybe the objective was wrong, or maybe we hit unexpected circumstances, such as the coronavirus pandemic, um, or maybe we need to look at, oh, did we do something that meant it made it really hard to achieve this objective? So for us, the value is more in the questions that we ask and how we learn and improve from that, more so than directly trying to, I guess, like, you know, come up with metrics for teams or value or strategic thingy. So quarterly basis is how we do that. And um, yeah, I don't know. I think I covered that. But again, please ask if uh, there's other follow up questions. Um, but yeah, uh, question from Lubica. Uh, is there more stress accumulating from the fact that your home, uh, your place for relaxing and chilling out is now a workplace? And do we have any advice on how to not to mix up our personal and work time and problems as well? Um, yes, so this is definitely something that lots of people I think are struggling with, not just or at the FT or just in general um, I have so we have some people on my team personally who are absolutely great and they are very driven and they always want to do more work and help out and uh, support people where they can um, we've had to be quite careful and insistent that to make sure that people 
uh, aren't working outside of their sort of like their uh, not shift hours, but you know the the time that you would normally be working. Um, and then we've encouraged people to turn off their email notifications and their Slack notifications as well, because otherwise the temptation really is very much there of oh I'll just have a look or if your phone goes ping and you're like oh I could help with that and support that. Um, what we've tried to make clear to our teams is we might be here for quite a long time. We don't exactly know how long this will go on for, but it could be another month or more or possibly even longer than that. We don't know. Um, because of that, we would much rather that people take their time and make, try and find that space to relax without working and burning themselves out and working constantly. Because at the end of this, we would, we would much rather they are happier and healthier than we've delivered a little bit more. In terms of what maybe I've seen suggested or what I've done, um, lots of people have suggested uh, trying to keep some kind of routine. Uh, so whether that's, um, you know, making sure that it, like, it depends on different people, but whether that's you get your breakfast and you still change clothes or have your morning shower or something and then move to a different place of the house. And this is now your like your work desk or your work area um, and you don't for example, uh, sit on your laptop in bed um, and you wake up and you start tapping away. And then even late at night, you're still maybe checking things to try and maybe separate those two things. Um, this might be harder if, depending where you live, of course, if you have the space or if you have uh, flatmates or family or things like that, trying to find the space. Uh, but one thing that someone recommended was trying to find somewhere as far away from your, uh, like your sleeping area, your bed, as possible so that you don't, you know, mentally, maybe you don't try and interlink those. Um, it's a bit trickier for me because I tend to use my work laptop as my personal laptop as well. Um, so if people do ping me on Slack while I'm just, you know, watching Netflix or something, uh, I can sometimes get notifications. Uh, but generally, I turn those off overnight. And I trust in my team that if someone needs my help or my advice, uh, they have my mobile number for an out of hours call, which is not very common, but sometimes I will be called out for that. Um, someone else suggested having an app. So I mentioned the schedule thing before, but uh, someone else suggested to me actually booking time in your calendar for different things, um, even in the like maybe for the evenings, which is OK, so we'll eat at this time or I will spend this time for myself or go for a walk or something like that to set a reminder. Um, I, Personally, haven't done that, but for maybe for some people that helps and it could work. So, yeah. Um, and if anyone else has got any tips as well, please um, do share them because I'm sure other people have got some good ideas there as well. Uh, off topic question recommend some online board games. Yes, I'll happily uh, pop some links into the uh, chat here or possibly on the Slack, whichever is easier. Um, there's one site called, uh, so the screenshot that I showed in my talk was of a, a game that is on Steam, which is a PC gaming sort of like marketplace. And that is called Tabletop Simulator. And there's lots of games on there that you can uh, download and play with your friends um, and they can join online. And normally we use Discord to do like voice chat as well. Um, there's some other websites, I think, boardgamearena.com and Tabletopia are two that I have uh, I've used a little bit of uh, and some of my friends recommended. So I'll, I'll pop some links into, I'll do it in the Slack channel so that it doesn't get lost, I guess, when this meetup closes. If you're on the Slack, I will, I will, do, I will do an at you as well. So hopefully that helps. Uh, question from Haralan. Uh, when we hire, do we look for people comfortable or experienced with remote work? So in the past, we have not, we have specifically not supported remote work. The people at the FT who were working fully remotely 100% of the time uh, were exceptions to that rule. And they, they had very specific circumstances in which uh, we made that happen for them. But in general, uh, previously before the coronavirus uh, pandemic, um, we would only hire in our technology locations. So that would be London, Sofia and Manila. We still allowed and enabled and encouraged flexible working. So people would work from home maybe two to three days a week, but it was never a goal to be fully remote. 
Um, so in that sense, we've never included remote working as part of our interview process or what we look for in people. I think uh, going back a little bit to that previous question about how things will change from this pandemic, um, again, none of this is the FT's official position, but I would not be surprised if we are now more open and receptive to people working for us remotely without being in one of those three technology locations. Um, because I think that there were legal and financial issues with getting that set up uh, in the past, such as if you're working in a location where we don't have a payroll or office that presents problems with things like benefits and tax and other stuff that we need to be conscious of and to help support that. But in general, um, I wouldn't be surprised if we become more open to people going, hey, I don't live in London or I don't live in uh, Sofia, but I would like to work for you. And, you know, we can then maybe do a bit more there. So that's not official, but that's my thought. I think we might do more there in the future. Cool. Oh, and thank you, Teddy, for sharing the um, Slack workspace link as well. So, um, yeah, if you aren't part of the Slack thing, please feel free to join. And if you think of any other questions after the meetup that you would like to ask, um, I am on there. So please do feel free to uh, like ping me and I will see those at some point. Um, but that's great. So thank, uh, I, don't, I think we're maybe running out of time, but thank you all so much for coming along. Um, I hope it was interesting and useful. Um, and I look forward to seeing many of you again in person, maybe next year at HatCon. But I'll pass back to Tony and she can uh, do that. Thank you, Vimiana. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yon. Uh, so guys, thank you very much for joining us. Teddy already shared with you our uh, Slack channel link from where you can join. Yon is there and we'll answer your questions. If you have more questions, feel free to ask them there. Thank you very much and stay tuned. Soon we will announce our next online event. We hope you enjoy it. Have a nice evening and see you soon. No worries. Take care. See you all soon. Bye bye. Yes.